Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, and one of the most common questions I get is, which laptop should I get for either photo or video editing? So I'm gonna to try to answer that today. It can be really difficult to name specific models because companies manufacture new releases of different models of laptops, uh, like literally every couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, one of the, the way this got started is Toshiba offered to send me a couple of laptops to review. And in fact, by the time I got those two Toshiba laptops, those specific models were no longer being manufactured. So we can talk about specific lines of laptops, but you'll just kind of have to understand what traits about laptops look for, like SSD versus standard conventional hard drives and how much memory to get. And then I can steer you in the right direction. But I will talk about some specific uh, makes of different laptops and, and help you find the right laptop just for you. So up first, I think the, the first decision you have to make is if you want a Mac or a PC or even a Chromebook. And uh, I'll address Chromebook first. Chromebooks do not run Adobe apps. So you can't run Lightroom or Photoshop on them, which means they're probably not right for the vast majority of photographers. They can be capable. You can run different, you can run your email and browse the web and such, and you can use web-based photo editing apps. They include some photo, functioning, photo functionality. But pretty much if you've gotten this far and you're looking for an app, uh, a tool specifically for photo and video editing, you want either Windows or Mac. And it, it won't make much of a difference. I have to disclose that I worked for Microsoft for like 10, 12 years, uh, writing many different books about them. So I'm way more familiar with Windows than I am with Mac. And for that reason, I always choose Windows PCs. Ultimately, the operating system doesn't make that much of a difference nowadays. Windows is, is quite secure. Mac OS has lots of security vulnerabilities. They both have uh, just as many flaws as strengths. The old, the old stereotypes that you probably had about Windows versus Mac, they, for the most part, they simply don't seem to exist anymore. Uh, but if you prefer Mac, go for it. I will say that Windows PCs, you tend to have a lot more options. And you, st and you can often find more bang for the buck. But Mac laptops, those PowerBooks, they have some amazing specs often and, and really great displays. So basically, whichever you want, but by default, I would probably steer you towards Windows because it tends to be uh, more value for your money. After you decide Mac versus Windows, your next decision is going to be the screen size. And uh, bigger is always better. A big 17-inch screen is always going to be better for photo and video editing than a small 10 or 13-inch screen. But of course, you then have to take that with you everywhere you happen to go. If you're traveling a lot, uh, I recommend a small screen. I wouldn't ever go smaller than a 13-inch screen. But I really like my Dell XPS 13 for travel. Uh, if you use like the MacBook Airs, you'll find they have a similar profile. But this folds up really nice, and it can fit in just about any camera bag, including all those camera messenger bags that we reviewed recently. And while it's not the most powerful laptop because it's they've optimized it for size uh, rather than performance, the fact that you can carry it with you ever everywhere means you might be you might choose to take it with you on vacation and get some photo and video editing done, or at least review them to make sure you got the shot. And for that reason, a small laptop like that is very useful. For day-to-day -day use, I push people bigger. 14-inch uh, laptops are sort of a compromise, but for day-to-day -day work, I generally prefer a 15-inch laptop, which is why we actually have three 15-inch laptops here. As you're working up close, that's about as big as you'd want to get. When you're traveling, it's these size screens tend to be a problem even when you're sitting in, in coach. <laughs> you simply can't push them far enough away from you, so you end up with it kind of scrunched up like that, especially when the guy in front of you leans his seat way back. So the size here actually can be a detriment, but if you spend most of your time working on your desk, keeping it on your lap, just traveling to and from work, 15-inch laptops tend to be the way to go. 17-inch laptops are, are great, but I find even for just generally traveling, going from work and back, they can be a bit cumbersome. Also, they're kind of few and far between, so you might not find uh, a 17-inch laptop with the specs you want. They, companies tend to make their most powerful and most uh, value-oriented laptops in the 15-inch size, but not in the 17-inch size. After screen size, screen resolution becomes really important, especially for these specific types of tasks, photo and video editing, because... Uh, a really high resolution screen means you can see more detail in your pictures and you don't have to spend as much time zooming in and out to check the resolution. It also means things like the tools in Photoshop and Premiere Pro and Lightroom, you can fit more of that on the screen. Now, 
a high resolution screen is, is generally better. And in fact, these two laptops are, these two Toshiba laptops are proper 4K laptops. So they have a 3840 by 1920 screen, which is outrageously high resolution with incredible pixel density. This little 13 inch laptop, it's, it's an older laptop and it's running at 720p. And that's a very low resolution. We're talking about the vertical lines of resolution here. And the problem I have with this, even though it's a small screen at 720p, it's, it's blocky. Like you can kind of see the individual pixels and I would happily trade it for a higher resolution screen. This is Justin's big uh, workstation here and it has an almost 4K screen and uh, that, that's good enough. Now, in the past, when you chose a high resolution screen, it meant that you had to go down to very, all, all your letters on the screen would end up being very, very small and you would end up really having to squint that's not the case with the modern revisions of, of Windows and Mac OS, including the Adobe apps. As long as you have the most recent versions of them, they will scale up the size of visual elements, mostly, to make them bigger. So you don't necessarily have to deal with tiny type. Instead, what happens is you get nice, smooth, like paper-like quality to the text, as well as additional detail to your eyes. Now, there's about 17 nerds right now writing a comment saying, oh, you can't perceive 4K detail, your eye can't see be beyond 300 DPI, so why would you ever need it? Well, you might not be able to see every single pixel on these 4K displays, but you can see more than one step down. So one step down from 4K tends to be a 1080p screen. And for a screen size like that, that's, that's pretty close to like 100 or 150 DPI and your eye can see usually about 300 dpi that's dots per inch or you could say ppi pixels per inch so even if you can't see all the pixels it will still look much nicer and you would definitely notice if you took one step down that you wouldn't have nearly as much sharpness and i have to make a point that 4k does not always mean 4k this particular laptop here the toshiba satellite laptop it's a great laptop and it has a lot of really nice features and it has a 4K display. But as soon as I got it, the first thing I did was I went to YouTube and I tried to watch a 4K video to see how beautiful it would be and it can't do it. What happens is the, the processor is not fast enough to decode the 4K video information and display it. So it just, it just stutters. So yes, this 4K laptop cannot play 4K video, not across the network, not from the hard drive. So if you are buying a laptop specifically for watching 4K video, you also need to think about the performance of it. Stepping up to this Satellite S model, it's plenty fast enough with its Core i7 processor and discrete graphics to be able to play back full 4K video. So it works much better for that purpose. Anyway, I just want to warn you, you can find 4K laptops that, yes, cannot play 4K video. You just have to check out the reviews and, and make sure that it is properly spec'd out with a higher end processor. If you ever plan to do any work outside, I know most people stay inside, but if you plan to work outside, you're gonna have a hard time looking at the screens on most laptops. Laptop brightness is measured in nits. And most laptops hover around 300, 400 nits, and those are, are good measurements for indoor visibility. If you want to go outdoors in the sun, you're going to need at least 500 nits, and that will usually mean getting a specialized outdoor laptop. Uh, just th this will vary by laptop, but if you can find a specification for nits, look it up for the specific laptop that you're considering and try to find one with a higher level. Again, usually you end up making some kind of compromises, and, and high levels of nits will require like massive battery usage, so it might not be a trade off that you're willing to make. Only if you're working outside. A lot of laptops nowadays have touch screens, and that's not something that's that important to me personally. I am more comfortable working with the touch pad on the bottom or just using a mouse. But a lot of people nowadays grew up on tablets and smartphones and they will instinctively reach for the screen. Some of, some of these laptops will have it, but it also comes with a cost. Touch screens almost always cost more and go through more batteries, even when you're not using the touch screen, just because it always requires some power. So I actually look for 4K laptops that don't have a touchscreen. These Toshibas both have touchscreens and they work just fine. I, I, it's not a deal breaker for me. I'm happy to have a touchscreen and when I do have it, I will end up using it, especially in a place like an airplane. Just another factor to consider. I also want to talk about laptop versus a, a more of a hybrid model. Right now we have a lot of 
models that are traditional clamshell laptops like this, where you can fold it open and use a keyboard. And that's my personal preference. If you're a person who likes tablets, you can get something like the Surface, Microsoft Surface, where the keyboard is essentially a cover for your laptop and it, it can behave in a clamshell way, or you can completely remove the cover and have it just behave like a tablet. Again, I don't like tablets, but I know a lot of people do. There's also a variety of laptops like this uh, Toshiba satellite here, where it will fold back on itself and kind of simulate a tablet. So now I can fold it completely back and still use the touch screen now to you know switch between tabs or control whatever it is that I'm watching. So it, it ends up being kind of a thick tablet, but nonetheless it's functional. And for those times when you are traveling and you want to watch a movie or something, you can just set the, the keyboard down and fold it back like this. The, the fact that it can take on different shapes and personalities uh, makes it more usable when you're traveling. And for me, if I were buying a laptop for students or for somebody who tra travels regularly or who's using their laptop for fun, I, I would definitely consider one of these kind of hybrid laptops that you know just might fit your lifestyle a little bit better. The processor in laptops is extremely important. And something to look out for is a lot of laptops will have extremely low end processors in there. I think because the manufacturers know that a lot of laptop buyers don't know how to select a processor that they need. Now, for the average person who just browses the web, checks their email, reads Reddit or whatever, the processor really won't matter. But if you're doing photo and video editing, the processor can be very, very important. Especially for video editing, there's no such thing as a processor that is faster than you need. <laughs> you need the fastest processor you can get and you will still be frustrated with the speed if you're doing video editing even if you have a desktop, really. So right now, they're making laptops, Windows laptops with uh, i3, i5, or i7 processors. Those are Intel processors, different families. The, the higher numbers are faster. And if you're doing photo or video editing, I definitely have to steer you towards one of the i7 processors. Beyond that, you have to look at the numbers for the specific processor to determine kind of how fast it's going to be. But here's what I recommend. Go to stp.io slash mobile CPU and look at the benchmarks there. Look up the benchmarks for the specific processor that you're considering in a laptop and how it compares to others. That's the best way to understand the kind of raw processing capability. I do want to mention though that laptops are not good at doing long time processing. So a faster processor here will definitely help you flip through Lightroom picking different pictures. But if what you want to do is do video rendering in Premiere Pro where the computer needs to just churn for two hours, a laptop's never going to be good at that because laptops are designed to conserve power. And they also don't have the ability to dissipate, dissipate heat as efficiently as a desktop. So what will happen is if they're working hard for a long period of time, the heat will build up, the laptop might not be able to dissipate it, and then it will begin to slow down. So the estimate for your rendering time will start at 30 minutes or 60 minutes, but by the time it's done, it will have been four hours because 20 minutes in, the laptop will start to get too hot and it will slow itself down a little bit. And uh, just something to look out for. It's one of the reasons that you might want to choose a desktop over a laptop if you're doing that sort of long, uh, long running work. As you're looking at processors, you'll have a choice between processors with more cores and higher megahertz ratings. The megahertz is the, the measurement of the actual operating speed of the processor, and that's the single most important thing for photo editing. Apps, specifically Lightroom, don't make efficient use of multiple cores. You can think of multiple cores as like having two engines in a single car, and the megahertz rating as being the horsepower of the engine. So when you look at the CPU benchmarks that I mentioned, that will be the cumulative power of the multiple engines times all the horsepower that they have. But something like Lightroom will only often only use a single engine. So in that case, if you, it can only take advantage of a single engine, a single core, then you'll get more performance out of a higher megahertz rating. Just something to consider if you get the choice between a, a four or a six core processor at a, at a lower megahertz rating, or if a processor with fewer cores at a higher megahertz rating, go ahead and choose that one with the fewer cores for the purpose of photo editing. 
for doing video editing. I find Premiere Pro in particular makes better use of multiple cores. It will max out all the cores in my in my computer. So go ahead and pick that that one with the higher benchmark, even if it means it also has more cores. Now let's talk about the hard drive, which is an extremely important component in, in any computer. Most computers nowadays, especially low-end laptops, will come with what might be labeled an HDD, or a conventional magnetic hard drive. This is the type of hard drive we've been using in computers for 20 years. It has literally like spinning magnetic platters and a little, a little needle and a head that reads the data off by using magnets, and by today's standards, they're extremely slow. They also have what's called a high latency which is the time it takes for the computer to find any individual bit of data. Because they're physically spinning around, when you go to open up a picture, the computer needs to find the first byte of that picture. So it needs to wait for that drive to spin around to the point where that first byte gets on the head. And that's what really takes a long time with the latency of the data, that time for that drive to spin around up to almost a full revolution. SSDs, on the other hand, solid state drives, don't have to wait. They're basically like RAM. You get instant access to any part of the data. They also tend to have a higher throughput. So you'll always get higher performance out of SSDs. Unfortunately, SSDs are available only in lower capacities and they tend to be at higher price tags. So for photo and video editing, uh, if you use a conventional hard drive, it will be slow, on, especially if you're shooting raw images. It'll be slow on any computer. For that reason, I strongly urge you to get a laptop with an SSD inside of it You'll get much better performance, even if you have to compromise on some other aspect of it, get an SSD. If you have to choose a computer with a slower processor or less memory, get one with an SSD. Whatever you have to do to get yourself into an SSD. Of course, there's, there's something in between these two, which is a hybrid drive. A hybrid drive is a conventional magnetic hard drive, but it has some portion of the drive set aside to, to work like an SSD, some smaller capacity of it, like it might be a, a two terabyte or a two terabyte drive with like a 64 or 128 gigs of SSD. And that can be a good compromise. But generally the operating system manages what's on the SSD part of it, what gets that high performance benefit. And usually they're specifically designed around making your computer reboot faster. So it'll be your, your operating system will be crammed in the SSD part of it. So for that reason, I don't necessarily push people towards those hybrids. They're, they're better than nothing. But generally, I want you to be on a full SSD. Now, some of these laptops, these, these two laptops each have a single hard drive. And most laptops will only have a single hard drive. But if you're looking for something to do photo and video editing, you're really going to want to try to find a laptop with multiple hard drives like this Toshiba Satellite S laptop. Toshiba configured this with an SSD for the operating system and applications. I think it's a 256 gig SSD. <clears throat> That's plenty and for plenty of room for that, plus my Lightroom catalog, plus whatever current video files I'm working on in Premiere. I'll put all the important stuff, the stuff I need immediate access to, on the SSD. The, the terabyte drive is a regular conventional magnetic drive, and it's slower, but it's bigger. So while my Lightroom catalog is on the SSD, I'll store all of my actual raw files on the conventional magnetic drive. That way, I can get rapid access to the catalog, I can browse through the previews really quickly, but when it comes time to export the photo, Lightroom will go back to the magnetic drive and, uh, and read directly from there. So it, when you have two drives like that, you spend a little bit of time shuffling files between them all the time because you'll be filling up your SSD. But for me, it's the only way I could possibly work. So if you're serious about doing photo and video editing, you definitely need one of these drives with, with one of these computers with two drives. Now, if you get a laptop with only a single drive and it's an SSD, choose the biggest capacity you can, because I guarantee you're never going to have too much space. You will fill up a 256 gig drive very, very quickly, especially if you're on vacation for a week and you're shooting raw, you can fill it up really fast. And when you run out of room, it's going to be really frustrating, especially if you're using that for your backup. Most of these can be upgraded. So if you buy a laptop and you're not happy with the drive, you, if you're a little bit competent with computers, you can probably swap out the drive, upgrade your conventional drive to an SSD, and that can breathe new life into an existing laptop. Laptop designs are very proprietary. They're very different from one model to another. So I would Google your specific laptop model and look for hard drive upgrade and see if there's a way to do it. 
It's not for the faint of heart, especially on a laptop, especially because you need to transfer over, over all your existing files, but it could be a lot cheaper than replacing your entire laptop. Wireless networking is very important for a laptop because that's how you'll connect most of the time. And especially if you're doing video editing where you might be uploading you know, a four gigabyte file to YouTube, you want network performance to be as fast as possible. Nowadays, you should look for the 802.11ac network standard. As I record this, that's basically the fastest available to consumers. And, and indeed, it is very fast and it's good enough for, uh, well, it'll, it's probably faster than your average internet connection. So it probably won't be the bottleneck. This will also be really important to you if you're moving files between your laptop and another computer. We do that a lot, move files from our desktops to our laptops. And when you're moving terabytes of data, <laughs> it can take a long time. And so faster networks are, are definitely going to benefit from, benefit from that. It'll also help if you have your wireless access point close to where you're working, because the farther away they are, the slower it gets. Anyway, just look for 802.11ac networking. Anything else is going to be a little bit slower. A lot of laptops nowadays will also have cellular connections available, which means they can get internet access from anywhere. That will cost you a little something extra. You'll have to pay for the cellular card in the laptop. You'll also have to have a service subscription from a wireless provider like Verizon or AT&T or Sprint or somebody. So there'll be a monthly fee. And this can end up costing a whole lot. So you can do that. If that's important to you, if you're traveling all the time, you should get that because connectivity is really important. What I do instead is I've just enabled tethering on my phone. So most Android phones and I, the iPhones nowadays, for an extra monthly fee, you can tether. And I'll just turn on tethering on my, on my phone, which will make it into a wireless access point that can get into the internet. Then I'll connect my laptop to my phone and get to the internet that way for those times when I need it. Especially when I'm traveling to other countries, it means I can just upgrade my smartphone to the local data plan and I don't have to worry about separately managing the internet connectivity for the different laptops that I might be using. If you are using a magnetic drive, I just wanted to give this tip. Leave some free disk space. <laughs> magnetic disk drives get slower and slower as you fill them up. Even SSDs do to some extent, but magnetic drives will slow to a crawl as you start to fill them up. So you always want to leave well, as much room as possible free, but at least 15%. If you get below 15%, it's going to be a real pain and it's really, really going to impact performance. So just free up as much space as you can and you'll find your laptop will be a lot faster. Another tip about disk performance is to use the smart previews in Lightroom. This is one of the most recent Lightroom's revi Lightroom revisions supports this. So you have to be working with Lightroom 6 or Lightroom CC to take advantage of this. But smart previews allow you to continue to view and edit pictures even when the original perhaps raw file is missing. So if let's say you have a laptop with a 256 gig drive and that's not enough room, you can store your files on a, a two terabyte external USB 3 drive, some external drive. But if you're traveling and you don't bring your drive with you, if you have smart previews enabled, you'll still be able to see those pictures. You'll be able to edit them. You just won't be able to export a high quality version until you connect the original uh, pictures on the external drive back to your laptop. Anyway, smart preview, previews in, in Lightroom really help for those of us who are shuffling multiple external drives with all of our pictures on it. I also want to say all hard drives eventually fail. And if that's the only copy of your pictures, then you're going to lose all your pictures. And that sucks a lot. And I get a lot of heartbreaking emails from people saying that their computer got trashed or got stolen at the airport or something and it had all their pictures on it. Offsite backups are the best way to solve this. Use a cloud backup service. And I, I'm not going to recommend a specific one. Just Google cloud backup service. There are lots of services that provide this. Your laptop will connect to the internet and just send all your files up there so that if there's a fire, if somebody steals your laptop, uh, if you spill coffee on your computer, they won't be completely lost. Having a local backup to an external hard drive is good, but it won't prevent you, it won't protect your files in the event of a natural disaster or theft or something like that. If you get the chance when you're, when you're shopping for laptops, actually try out the touchpad. So some of the some of learning to use the touchpad is just training. It's like muscle memory, learning how gentle or rough to be with it to make it work properly. But some touchpads just work better than others, and it, it varies by laptop. And if you get a laptop with a terrible touchpad, it's, it's terrible. It can make you never want to use the computer again. It can be really frustrating when it's clicking where you don't want to click. 
like this, this XPS 13 here. I like this laptop, but the touchpad is crap and I've been putting up with it for years. So that's what compels me to say, watch out for those touchpads. I like the touchpads on the Toshiba's much better. Another option is just to get an external mouse for it. So I, I like the Logitech MX mouses. Those work really well. They put a little, a little dongle in one of your USB ports, but it'll connect wirelessly and they have models that are bigger for your desk or smaller for travel. And they just beat the crap out of uh, the touchpads. This is my favorite. This, we all have this in the office. There's one of these on all of our desks because it's just fantastic. You can pick one up at sdp.io slash MX. And this is the travel model I use. Go to scp.io slash M510. Great precision. Um, another factor to look for in laptops is USB 3. So USB goes through different versions, just like everything in, in the modern world. USB 2, by modern standards, is extremely slow. USB 3 is much, much faster. This is useful for loading pictures from a memory card reader to your laptop quickly. Because, you know, when you've just taken a full day of pictures and you're dying to see your pictures, but your computer is loading them so slowly, well, this will, this will cut that torture short by quite a bit. Uh, to know if your computer has laptop uh, USB 3, just be sure to read the description. Look for this logo, the SS, or look for a USB port that's blue. The little connector inside of it will be blue. That means it's USB 3. Some laptops will have one USB port, three port, and some USB 2 ports. So that can be a little frustrating because sometimes you'll have two different USB 3 devices that you want to connect. Just something to look out for. I definitely wouldn't get a laptop without at least one USB 3 port. This is my favorite reader, especially for travel because it's nice and small. It's also really inexpensive. SDP.io slash reader. It does support USB 3. So those pictures come off really quickly. RAM is uh, really important for both photo editing and video editing, but especially for video editing. Four gigabytes is kind of the absolute minimum. My little XPS 13 here has four gigs of RAM and it does pretty well with Lightroom because it also has a fast SSD drive. But if you had just four gigs and a conventional magnetic drive, that would be painfully slow. For, most part, for the most part, you want to have at least eight gigs of RAM. Having 16 gigs of RAM, even for Lightroom, isn't too much. You'll definitely benefit from it. If you're doing photo or video editing, especially 4K video, more is always better. My, my desktop now has 64 gigs of RAM. You probably won't find that in a laptop, but you can find some laptops that will support 32 gigs of RAM. 16 gigs can certainly get the job done, though. These are pretty big tasks. Some laptops will have either integrated graphics, which means the, the graphics card, the card that runs your monitor, it can be built onto the motherboard. And that's the least expensive way to do it. It's also the most power efficient way to do it. So most laptops have that in integrated graphics. And uh, for photo editing, that's, that's perfectly fine. That's probably what you want to look for. More powerful laptops will have what they call discrete graphics. They'll list a little separate memory card, uh, video card. And that's great for um, playing back 4K video. It can kind of be a necessity for playing back 4K video, but especially for video editing because um, video editing apps will offload a lot of stuff to a discrete graphics card. Now, the most recent version of Lightroom and, and Photoshop too, can send some things over to the graphics card. They can offload it. But I found, especially with laptops, that that actually slows performance. So maybe in the future, Adobe will get their act together and actually take advantage of the ability to send stuff off to the graphics card. But right now, I just recommend everybody turn it off. Therefore, for just photo editing, I would not look for a discrete graphics card. One of the differences between consumer laptops and like professional business laptops is the ability to connect to a docking station. So if you're commuting between home and work and you're always using your laptop in both places, the, the, the port for the docking station means you can just pick up your laptop and go and you can set it back on your desk and instantly get access to your mouse, keyboard, various monitors and such, just like Justin uses at his desk. Consumer laptops will not have a connection for a docking station here. Justin, for example, has docking stations at both home and work, meaning when he gets home, he just connects it in. All his accessories come to life instantly. If you don't have that, then you probably have like four different USB uh, things that you're plugging in, like a USB keyboard, and then maybe an external monitor that you're like screwing in or pushing into the HDMI port. And it's just, it's a convenience to have the docking station. 
Um, but if you're doing it every day, it's really nice. Another factor to consider is upgradability. Many laptops can be upgraded, but not all of them. Like this Dell XPS 13 here is not designed to be upgraded. I could take it apart and eventually get to the inside guts and maybe I'd be able to upgrade the drive, but I can't ever add more memory to it. It's fixed. It's like soldered on there. Laptops like Justin's big uh, Dell M4800 here are designed to be upgraded because they're designed for business use. And um, that means that we've been able to upgrade his memory. Another factor there is it can actually save you money if it's upgradable because you can buy a laptop with the least expensive memory configuration, buy it with four gigs, and then go to Amazon and find cheap memory or good quality memory, but less expensive than directly from the manufacturer and upgrade it yourself to 16 or 32 gigs or whatever it is. You can save hundreds of dollars that way. The only real way to know if your laptop is upgradable is to search on the internet because like these Toshiba laptops, technically, if you go to upgrade them, you'll probably void the warranty. I don't know how they enforce that or not, but they're not designed to be upgradable. But I searched around and lots of people actually do upgrade the drives, but not the memory. Like the memory is fixed, but the drives aren't. So being able to upgrade the drives means I could replace the magnetic HDD with a fast SSD. Or when uh, Seagate releases the newer high capacity drive, I could swap out the existing drive and get more capacity without uh, having to upgrade the entire laptop. So search the internet for other people who've managed to replace the hard drive in a particular laptop model before you buy it to see if it's actually upgradable. Now I'm going to show off a couple of these Toshiba laptops. This first one is the Toshiba Satellite Radius, and it has a nice 4K display. It's very thin for a 15-inch laptop, and as I showed earlier, it has this sort of convertible configuration. It's uh, the, the laptop that I would recommend for somebody who is like going off to college. If I were getting a laptop for a kid for doing their homework, this is the laptop I would get. Like I said, it's not powerful enough to play back 4K video, much less edit it. Nor is it a good laptop for gaming. But for homework, for research, uh, even for running Lightroom, it's just fine. And I love the keyboard and the look of it is very professional. Really nice laptop. A higher end laptop is the Toshiba Satellite S, and it's not convertible. This is as far back as the screen can go. So it doesn't flip around like that. It does have a touch screen, however. It's a little bit more durable, but it's perfect for photo and video editing because it has two hard drives. It has that fast SSD where you want to put your Lightroom catalog on there. You want to put your Premiere Pro files and the files that you're currently editing on that fast SSD. But then either you can use the bigger magnetic drive as backup or you can use that for the permanent storage of files that you're accessing less frequently, like pictures from last year and the year before. Uh, that one terabyte drive won't fill up nearly as fast as that 256 gig SSD. It also has plenty of memory for these types of tasks and a discrete NVIDIA graphics card. This one has a very high-end i7 processor. It pays, plays back and edits, well, plays back 4K video flawlessly. Editing 4K video is, is tough on any laptop, but it does HD video just perfectly, and it, it is workable with 4K video. I've done quite a bit of 4K video editing on the road with it, and it's, it's just fine. Uh, it's really hard to get a laptop that will do <laughs> 4K video editing really well. Toshiba does have a line that is more professional, the Tecra line, and they couldn't get me a copy to actually show off, but if I were recommending a laptop for 4K video editing, I'd probably push you towards that Tecra line. The Dell Precision line is, is kind of along the same lines as that Tecra in that it's a proper workstation. So it has a discrete graphics card. Everything is designed to be upgradable. It's not pretty. Like, look how nice and pretty this satellite is. It's nice and, and thin. This Dell is much bigger and chunkier. It's just, it's just ugly compared to the Toshiba. But because it's a business laptop, it's designed for for function over form. And I don't think any of us mind that at all. It's been a, a good laptop for us. It's a big clunky thing, but the fact that we've been able to upgrade the drives has added a lot of, of life to this particular model and allowed us to use it for longer and longer. If you have any questions for me, just add a comment down below. If this was helpful to you at all, if it has some good information, please give me a like. That will just encourage me to go. 
Share with your friends, click subscribe for more free videos, and uh, thanks. Talk to you later.